Unfortunately for him, Scooby-Doo style, some meddling kids were making a video from another lane of traffic of the car driving along, and you clearly see the car, without really turning, just go straight into the bay. And conspicuous in its absence was a pelican. About two years ago, I made a video about one of those cars that's really gotten away that I really kicked myself for not finding a way to make the opposite decision. It was a 2006 Bugatti Veyron that at the time and still to this day was the cheapest one to ever sell. Now, I've been very clear that the Veyron is really the only car above my LP640 in terms of value other than a McLaren F1 that I honestly do dream about owning. And the fantasy of ever stumbling across the world's cheapest version of it is obviously something that dominates my psyche. But at the same time, this car just couldn't be made to make sense at the time. And I shared the whole story of it, but the car's backstory was just about as insane as you could ever imagine. It really got interesting around 2009 when a man named Andy House drove it into the Galveston Bay. Now, obviously I like flood cars. I do prefer a freshwater flood, but what happened was he decided to just drive it into the bay. And he claimed to his insurance company that he did so avoiding a pelican. Unfortunately for him, Scooby-Doo style, some meddling kids were making a video from another lane of traffic of the car driving along. And you clearly see the car without really turning, just go straight into the bay. And conspicuous in its absence was a pelican. And so they obviously decided this was insurance fraud. They did not pay out the claim. They charged him with insurance fraud. And he went to prison for about 10 months. I think he had a longer sentence, but he got out early. And during that time and throughout the insurance investigation, the car had been kind of put in the custody of a Houston-based exotic car mechanic who at some point might have been interested in rebuilding this car. And so he had provided estimates and disassembled the car and kind of spread it out amongst about a 3,500 square foot warehouse where it set for a very, very long time. But once Mr. House got out, he still had clear title to this car. And so he tried to sell it and did so to an exotic car dealer. Now, of course, since the insurance company did not pay out a claim, the title did not have a brand. It didn't have a salvage title or a flood title or any of the other things that would render the car unacceptable to most lending institutions to finance. And so this exotic car dealer, or I suppose its owner, got a $980,000 loan for the car. Now, a clean title, 06 Bugatti, could somehow justify that kind of loan. And most exotic car banks do not require an in-person inspection or any proof that the car is actually functional. So even though he had paid, obviously, a lot less than $980,000, he then had the budget to start the rebuild. Unfortunately, his dealership went out of business, he declared bankruptcy, and he stopped making the payment. Now, during that time, the car never moved. It stayed with the same mechanic in the same shop, and actually, he started to paint the car white. But unfortunately, this exotic car dealer's business went under, he declared bankruptcy personally, and so the car was repossessed by the bank, which they obviously discovered was not fully functional. Now, of course, all of the repair bills and the parts and the painting and everything that had been done to the car using that budget between the $980,000 and whatever he had actually paid to buy the car were now with this mechanic. And he starts threatening the lien holder that he's going to mechanics lien the car if they don't pay him. Of course, they decide not to, and they actually end up just giving him title to the car. Because his bills at that point would have been several hundred thousand dollars, they would have had no real way to liquidate or even value what this carcass of a Bugatti might have been worth. So it goes into the ownership and continued possession of this mechanic, and he sells it again to a local Houston-based physician who has delusions of grandeur that he is somehow going to orchestrate the rebuilding of this car, and he doesn't. And so he asks the same guy to sell the car again for him, who then enlists Andy House, the guy who originally drove it into the Galveston Bay, to broker the car. So I start to see these Facebook posts, everybody starts sharing it, and the car is for sale in 2019 for $300,000. Now at the time, and still today, give or take a million dollars is the market value for an 06 or an 08 Veyron with some miles on it. And this is a nicely specced car, but obviously it needs a considerable amount of rebuilding. And so I begin the process of trying to decide 
am I gonna try to buy this car? Of course, I didn't have $300,000. We had just started to get some traction on YouTube and I was having a lot of fun. The app was growing. Everything was going really well in life, but I was still in no position to buy the car, much less finance the inevitable repairs. And it was really, really hard to estimate the repairs. And so I called Freddie Tavares, a good friend then, certainly a better friend now. And this was just at the end of his Gallardo rebuild, right around the time that he was starting the Murcielago project. So anytime a car is saltwater flooded, you're gonna get a tremendous amount of corrosion. And that was certainly present around the axles and the brakes and the wheels and everything along the bottom of the car, the turbochargers included. And we knew that the wiring was gonna be a problem. And since he had done a lot of rewiring on his Gallardo, it being a Volkswagen Group product, he had a lot of confidence that he was somehow going to be able to remake the wiring harness since Bugatti had been very clear that they were not going to sell any parts for this car. Now. We assumed that we'd be able to talk them into it, but that was certainly not a given. So I started talking to the guys from Premier Financial Services about what they would realistically loan on the car. And of course, I was very honest about its condition. I wasn't trying to get 900,000 bucks. I was just like, look, they want me to pay 300. I'm obviously gonna try to shrewdly negotiate this a little bit, but I'm gonna end up deep into the car and I'm gonna have to spend a lot more money on it. What can we do? We started talking about what the real liquidation value would be of the car as parts, as decoration, as furniture, and things like that. And eventually it just became clear that like financially, I didn't have a great roadmap as to how I was going to put this amount of money together. Beyond that, when you think about a 30 or 40% value reduction for a rebuilt car, even without a title brand, you know, you're looking at a car that was probably gonna be worth six to maybe $700,000 when it was done. Now today, values are probably a little bit higher, maybe it's a little bit more, but regardless, we didn't have a huge margin and it wasn't gonna be a profit-seeking flip. I didn't wanna sell the car once it was finished. I wanted to daily drive the thing. But I knew that if things went real pear-shaped, we didn't have a great ripcord to have a huge cushion to know that we could just buy more parts or do whatever it took to make the car right again. And so I didn't buy it, it went away, we made some videos about it. And I know for Freddie, even more than me, it was really the car that got away because again, both of our channels at the time were kind of at this point where we were starting to get consistent viewership. His would peak higher than mine, mine would stay more consistent over time. But regardless, we weren't at a point where we could count on YouTube revenue to make a car that didn't make financial sense make financial sense. We were at the kind of point where if I got a ticket, the AdSense might pay for it. Or if he needed an extra part, it might pay for it. Those aren't Veyron numbers, unfortunately. And since we couldn't be super duper confident on exactly when we could have the car finished, it was a really hard thing to pitch to sponsors. Of course, sponsors aren't gonna buy you a Bugatti, but they might offer some financial cushion to help make a bad day less of a bad day. But that wasn't really available at the time and it wasn't something that we could do. And so we both had to kind of let it go. But I know he spent a lot of time on the woulda, coulda, shoulda, wished he'd been able to figure out a way to do it. Now fast forward about a year, last summer, we were shooting our second Car Trek series. The first one being who could buy the coolest exotic car for the price of a Camry. The second one was who could find the most appreciated supercar. And we'd driven a really long route around Florida and up to Amelia Island for the first one. So we decided for the second series, we would do a fixed spot. So we wanted to find a place where we would have a mechanic, a track, a shop, all the different things that we could need to kind of build the storyline of a Car Trek series in one place and we decided to go to Las Vegas. We ran at Spring Mountain Racetrack out in Pahrump. We went driving up in the mountains. It was just a fantastic trip in my Vanquish, Freddy's Maserati, and Tyler CL65. And since we needed to be able to ship cars out there and we needed a shop for the wizard to do his inspections of our cars, we called Houston Crosta of Royalty Exotic Cars, an exotic car rental company in Las Vegas. Now, when Freddie told his story of kind of his thoughts on this project back two years ago, one thing he had mentioned is that there are actually a good number of used parts on the market, usually on eBay, for Bugattis. And the seller of most of those happens to be Houston. Now he's owned several of the cars personally. He has a red one now. He had a Mansori modified one that he did a lot of videos with Daily Driven Exotics. And so he had rear wheel drive converted that. He had done a lot of service himself, both in fixing it after he broke it and in doing some of the routine stuff. Because the other monster in the closet, anytime you got a Bugatti that's been sitting, regardless of why it was sitting, is that the servicing is insane. Uh, the tires are $22,000 a set. The annual service they say is $21,000 and sometimes you can get a $10,000 service the second year, but then you gotta do another 20 plus thousand dollar one the next year. Anything that breaks is catastrophically expensive. And so it's just one of those things that 
actually keeping one of these cars on the road is more of a private jet proposition financially than it is owning a Lamborghini or something that we've become a little bit more accustomed to. And so he had talked to Houston at the time about some of the parts and things like that. And back in 2019, Houston had also considered buying the car. But we knew that the car had sold elsewhere. I had heard that it went to Dubai. I heard some other rumors regardless, whatever. But we knew that the car was no longer available because down the road, we had actually gone back and tried to buy it again. And so we show up at Houston's shop and he had kind of told us he had something he wanted to show us. Now, of course, there's new and interesting exotic cars in and out of his shop and his office every single day, so that was not wildly surprising. But when we go into the shop that he told us we could use to film, up on the lift is a black Bugatti Veyron. And it's got a lot of corrosion on the underside. And we're like, you bought it. He said, yep, I bought it. Now this had just happened. So the car had been somewhere else for the better part of a year. And we were just now learning about this and he was still pretty cagey about the details, but obviously it was his intent and he was already well into disassembly to put this car back together in a functional way. He had an exhaust, he had an aftermarket set of wheels, he had all the fluids, a service kit ready right behind it. And so, I mean, Freddie and I are just going nuts because this dream that we had is now gonna be on another YouTube channel and it's gonna be in another person's garage. And it was just a little bit heartbreaking while we're in the middle of trying to put on a show and avoid the heat for car trek. And so we look around the car a lot more than he wanted us to. I took a lot of pictures that he wasn't that excited about, but since then he's explained a lot more to me about how he came about owning the car. And he told me that he didn't mind if I shared a lot of that with you. And he's gonna come by at some point in the next few months to tell more of the story because he's almost done now, over a year later, with putting the thing back together. And so what he said happened is that at the time that the car sold, he had a full interior, he had a bunch of body panels, he had some axles and other things listed on eBay for Aveyron for sale. And the guy that bought the car for 300 grand contacted him interested in some of the parts. And Houston was obviously willing to sell him. I think he worked out a deal at one point to sell him most of the stuff for about 150 grand, something like that, which is a really good deal relative to what you'd have to pay. But who else was gonna buy the thing? And I think it kind of crept into this guy's mind that he was the market for used Bugatti parts and he felt like he was being taken advantage of. Now that also could have had something to do with the fact that he told Houston that he had already spent $100,000 on the car. Now Houston asked him, he's like, what did you spend the money on? Because the car had never left the same mechanic that had had it since 2009. He said, well, I paid him to paint the car black and he did some more disassembly and he did some more diagnosis and whatever. And so I'm another hundred grand in with that guy, 400 total. And eventually he just says, Houston, will you just buy this car from me? And Houston says, well, of course I will, but I'm not gonna pay more than 300 because it being black doesn't add any value to me. I can't see any work that he's done. And no one's been able to show anyone evidence that the car will actually turn over. He's like, I wanna see a video of the pistons moving because we don't know how seized the motor is at that point. Nothing happens, he doesn't hear anything for a few months and then he said one day in his email box he gets a video and it is of <laughs> the car turning over. So at that point he agrees, he says that was the boogeyman of the whole equation was whether or not I was gonna have to replace the motor. So sure, I'll pay you 400 grand and he proceeds to start arranging shipping. At which point I think the windshield flew out of the car during open transport and shattered all over the highway. But regardless, he was still missing a bunch of parts, but it was now in Vegas, and that's the point in which we saw the car. Now, of course, Freddie and I were confused. It's like, who paints the car black before they do all the rebuilds? But this was now the second time that this mechanic had facilitated or done the repainting of the car, first to white, then now to black. And so regardless, it was a fascinating thing. So we're crawling all over it. Obviously, the interior is totally out of it. You can just see how rusted the turbos are and everything else, and I mean, the car is a basket case, but Houston's mechanic had probably done more independent Bugatti service than just about anybody else in the United States at that point. So if anybody was up for it, it was going to be him. And he was talking about some of the things he wanted to do. He actually took us in to show us his full interior for the car that was gorgeous, kind of a natural brown, like Ferrari Cuyo, something like that. And he was getting rid of most of the gray interior and stuff like that. And so, you know, he knew he was gonna need a lot of parts. And he told me this week that he spent over $250,000 on parts with Bugatti. So fortunately, obviously he's spent a lot with Bugatti servicing his other cars and stuff like that. They did sell him a lot, including a wiring harness, which was the biggest issue. And so he is still waiting on a few over a year later. And so he's hopeful that he'll have most of the rest of the parts soon to be able to get the car to run. Now again, that doesn't include getting the car serviced. It doesn't include making the car drive. He said the Burmeister sound system is totally corroded and that's over $100,000 to replace with new parts. He's not sure how he's gonna deal with that. It's a full fiber optic system. So it's not without more hurdles, but we did find the car and I can't explain how shocked 
Freddie and I were. And I know that we both kicked ourselves because today, kind of like Freddie described in the economic video about his 675 LT, he's spent what he could have just bought a good car for when he started the project. But at the same time, he's created amazing content, he's gotten good sponsorships, he's made some AdSense revenue. And so it's not a wildly profitable endeavor, but it makes it make sense. And if we were approaching the project today, we could make it make sense. In fact, Houston has bought Alex Rebuild's channel, it's now Royalty Rebuilds, and he's gonna use that as a way to release a series of what he's doing with this car, including he's repainted it again. It is now purple and a uh, nice shade of purple, I suppose. Wouldn't have been what I would have done with it. And he's obviously making the car a heavily modified example. He's probably gonna keep it rear wheel drive. He's gonna keep aftermarket wheels on it, aftermarket exhaust, maybe even an aftermarket ECU tune and stuff like that. And that wouldn't have been the way that I necessarily wanted to own it. I love the way they built the car in the first place. I loved how it was set up to go 250 miles an hour. And so taking it away from that would have diminished the experience for me. And so. I'm glad it's him doing it that way rather than me trying to do it mine because I know I would have ended up a million dollars into the thing, which I still don't have. And so that would have been heartbreaking just to watch the car sit, collect more dust and wait for me to be able to figure out a way to do it. But regardless, it was awesome to be reconnected with the car and I cannot wait to see what Houston does with it in the future. We'd like to thank Patrick Adair Designs for their support of the VinWiki channel this month. Patrick and his team make some of the most amazing rings you've ever seen, including this one made out of carbon and the aluminum from one of the wheels of my LP640. They've just released a new automotive themed ring with carbon fiber and anodized titanium. It's a super cool looking thing, and whether you're looking for a wedding band or just a fashion ring or whatever you want a ring for, he has some amazing options. You can use the code VinWiki for a discount, so check them out now at the link in the description below and thank them for their support of VinWiki.